How do you feel about Kizuru's character after the egghead arc? Especially after chapter 1124. What do you think about Kizuru? How do you feel towards his character? I think many of you would agree with me that throughout the course of the egghead island arc, Kizuru's actions and motivations were very confusing. I had a really hard time pegging down what he was really up to, what he really thought, what his goals were, what he really wanted to do. And to some extent, now seeing his response to the whole ordeal in chapter 11. 124, I definitely do feel more empathetic towards him now, but after reading that chapter, I still wasn't sure that I fully understood him. I don't know if I felt that his involvement at the Egghead Island arc, most particularly the fact that he killed his best friend Vegapunk, I wasn't sure that chapter 1124 absolved him. And I'm sure I'm not the only one that felt this way. Even in response to chapter 1124, I saw people express their frustrations, their disappointment. Some were downright angry at Kizaru. And I know that personally for me, after reading this chapter, I didn't know how to feel. I just still felt very unsure about the whole situation and about Kizaru's involvement in the arc. And I do think that, at least to some extent, these feelings, this response towards Kizaru does have a lot to do with the fact we as fans had a lot of expectations for him and then he didn't actually carry out what we imagined he would in the arc. Whether you were expecting Kizaru to blow us away with his showing of strength and might because you were expecting him to be this super combatant that reaffirms our belief in the strength of the marine admirals who were at the end of the day were described as the monsters of marine officers the greatest military powers or whether you were expecting him to blow us away by way of a major plot twist a plot twist involving Kizaru turning on the marines turning on the institution and helping the straw hats help Vegapunk escape instead. But by the end of the arc, I would say that he did neither of those things. Sure, until the very end, he carried out his duties as a marine, he did get involved, and majorly so, in key battles. But he wasn't this major powerhouse that made us or at his power and strength. Those fights with Luffy actually made me feel more excited towards Luffy and his strength rather than Kizaru's. But at the same time, he killed his best friend, carried out his duty, and until chapter 1124, we never saw him seriously or deeply express his regret at having to do so. And so, like I was saying, after chapter 1124, I definitely felt sorry for him. It made me empathize with him a little bit better. But I still felt a little disappointed disappointed. Or maybe not disappointed, I just felt conflicted. And I'm sure this word is going to keep popping up again and again, but I just felt unsure. So that made me go back and reread the Egghead Island arc focusing on Kizaru. And the more I read and the more I thought about it, I actually started to realize maybe this is exactly how I'm supposed to be feeling towards Kizaru. Feeling unsure and feeling uncertain is actually the perfect response that encapsulates Kizaru as a character. His motto, after all, is unclear justice. So it's fitting that his actions, his motivations, his behavior at Egghead, all throughout the arc, he has been very unclear. So today I want to discuss what has been probably one of the most polarizing aspects of the Egghead Island arc, and that's the role and involvement of Kizaru. We've known even before the Egghead Island arc that Kizaru alongside Sentomaru and Vegapunk had this special bond. Sentomaru called Kizaru his uncle, even though it didn't seem like they were of blood relation. We knew that it was Kizaru's devil fruit ability that Vegapunk modeled his pacifistas after. And this close relationship was something that was pretty clearly confirmed in Egghead, and quite early on in the arc. Even though it was only in chapter 1124 that Kizaru outright called Vegapunk his best friend, we still knew from quite early on, we knew that they still had a close, friendly relationship. And this bond, this closeness between them was something that was further expanded on as the arc progressed, not only revealing the relationship between Vegapunk and Kizaru, but also between Kizaru and Kuma and Bonnie. And this relationship is exactly why fans very much expected Kizaru to turn on the Marines and to help his friends. And it certainly seemed like that was possible, because throughout the course of the arc, Kizaru kept making comments and kept acting in ways that made him feel a little suspicious. I think the best way that I could put it is that 
His actions felt quite lukewarm. It was as if he wasn't acting in any definitive way. He couldn't fully commit to killing his friends as we saw in his interactions, in his clashes with Sentomaru and Bonnie. But at the same time, he couldn't act to definitively save his friends. Throughout the whole of the arc, no one knew whose side he was on. We didn't know where his true allegiance lay. I actually remember some of the discussions that were happening in the fanbase, especially after Kizuru took more of a backseat after the rest of the Gorosei arrived at the Eket Island. Some people were still holding out that maybe Kizuru will intervene, maybe he'll help Vegapunk escape, while others in another camp they were calling out that first camp, just calling Copium. Kizaru was a heartless monster. There was no way that he's coming back to save his friends. And this is something that divided the fanbase somewhat. And I think what majorly contributed to this confusion was his classic nonchalant, carefree, laid-back personality. If you go back and reread this arc, in all his actions and all his dialogue, it's quite hard to get a definitive read on his character. It's hard to discern what he's truly feeling and what he truly desires. On one hand, we see him countlessly commenting that he doesn't want to do this, he doesn't want to kill Vegapunk, he's not happy that he's here. But then on the other hand, his tone, his expressions, they don't necessarily match his words. In some cases, it almost feels sarcastic the way that he talks, like he doesn't actually care. Here are some examples of what I'm talking about. Here, in this conversation with Sentomaru before Kizaru actually arrives at Egghead, Kizaru says that he and the Marines don't want to have a battle. But the way he says this, he makes it sound as if he just thinks it's a waste of potential Marine technology, more so than he thinks it's a loss and he's regretful about losing his friend. Or here in chapter 1104, Vegapunk calls Kizaru out. He chides him, you're a sad man. And Kizaru just coolly accepts this. He just goes along with what Vegapunk says, accepts, agrees. He almost makes fun of himself that he's a tragic sight. But the way that he says it, it feels almost sarcastic. His expression, he doesn't look like he's all that sorry towards Vegapunk. I think it doesn't help that we don't get a clear shot of Kizaru's face after he blasts a hole through Vegapunk's stomach. Without getting to see his expression, we don't know how Kizaru is really feeling in that moment. But at the same time, in other instances, the way that he acts makes makes it seem like he really was trying to limit his involvement in this battle. When we see him fight Luffy, he takes his time. He doesn't seem all that desperate to finish him quickly so that he can move on and kill Vegapunk even though he does recognize and acknowledge that he can't spend so much time just parrying with Luffy back and forth and that he does need to carry out his responsibility. And it is much more fitting of Kizaru's character, the way that he acts in such a cool, nonchalant manner when he fights Luffy. But in some ways, you could argue that he is actually just trading blows. It doesn't seem like he is taking this fight super, super seriously, or at least to the level that he should be if he recognizes that Luffy actually isn't such an easy opponent and he is actually going to have to step it up if he wants to carry out what he's supposed to do. He chose, actively chose not to kill Bonnie and said that he doesn't want to kill Bonnie. He only actually attacks her after he's directly ordered to by Saint Saturn. Even then, before he kills Bonnie and Kuma or before he goes to kill Bonnie and Kuma, he pauses and he actually reassures Bonnie that he's gonna make it quick, he's gonna make it painless. And this pause is what gives Luffy the time and opportunity to attack Kizaru, stopping Kizaru from fulfilling out Saturn's orders to kill Bonnie and Kuma. It's almost as if Kizaru stalled. And I don't mean that to say that I think Kizaru was actively stalling, but I do definitely feel that throughout the arc, his heart just wasn't in the battle. Saturn actually did note that for Kizaru's standards, this work was sloppy. It was sluggish. It didn't meet the standards of what Saturn knows Kizuru is capable of. Even Sakazuki in chapter 1124 seems initially disappointed in him. And I think it's very telling that they both feel this way. They know what Kizuru is capable of. And although Saturn does accept that Kizaru's less than stellar performance or stellar outcome was because of the fact that he was fighting against Gear 5th Luffy, Nika Luffy, and Nika Luffy is no joke, he is a true force to be reckoned with in his own right. And I wholeheartedly recognize that Luffy is 
Gift with Luffy is a menace. He's not an easy opponent, but I think it's equally true that Kizaru's heart and soul just wasn't in this battle. And I think that also played a major part in him not being able to perform so well. It might not have been an active, conscious decision to pull his punches, but I just don't think he was able to give it his all. And now, after reading chapter 1124, understanding how he does actually feel towards his friend, this arc being so full of of contradictory moments, the fact that it was hard to understand his actions and his motivations, all of that makes sense now. The answer is that there is no clear answer. Kizaru was feeling internally conflicted. And an easy comparison we could make for Kizaru in this situation would be Garp. Garp's similar situation, the similar internal conflict that Garp faced at Marineford, the conflicting values, his conflicting duty towards his family and the Marines. The same way that Kizaru was torn between his friends and his duty. But I would actually say that in a lot of ways, it's actually also difficult or maybe inappropriate or not quite accurate in applying that same comparison. I would actually say that it's not as simple as it was understanding Garb as to understand Kizaru. And I think that comes down to our knowledge of the individual sense of justice and their sense of morality. It was easier to understand Garb and how he was feeling and why he was acting the way he was at Marineford because of what we knew about him as a character. We know Garp's ideals and morals. We know him as the hero of Marines, but one who has his own sense of justice, his own ideals of being intrinsically committed to the people. His commitment to the Marines is out of his desire and his values and his sense of justice that is tied with the people, with ordinary citizens. It's the same reason why he has refused to take on the Admiral position, because he knows that once he takes on that role, his first priority becomes a Celestial Dragon, and he can't prioritize the people. And so in this way, his commitment to the Marines, his commitment to his duties at Marineford becomes much more easily understood. We can understand and empathize with that conflict when he's forced to choose between his duties and his family. Whereas I would argue that this isn't exactly the same situation we have with Kizaru. Namely, because there is no deep-rooted ideology or sense of justice no sense of value that makes us feel like he should be this committed to the Marines. In fact, Kizaru is quite unique as a Marine Admiral because he doesn't have a clear sense of morality or justice. In fact, his motto is in fact that, unclear justice, ambiguous justice, which I think makes his decision to stick with the Marines instead of helping his friends even more baffling. It'd be easier to understand this decision if we knew that he truly cares for the work of the Marines if we knew that he truly feels that this institution is the solution in this crazy, dangerous, unfair world they live in. You know, if he was an admiral like Fujitora or Aokiji, both of whom are highly altruistic, highly moralistic, they would sacrifice their friend because it meant the safety and the overall well-being of the populace. But we've never seen any indication that Kizaru feels the same way towards the marines or towards people. We've seen in the past that he's actually pretty careless. Careless to the extent that he might hurt civilians, inadvertently so, and it seems like he doesn't really dwell on it if he does happen to hurt people. At Saobori, we see him accidentally hit a mangrove tree. The tree falls down, makes a a big explosion, but he's pretty flippant about it. He's pretty flippant about exerting too much force that might accidentally have some damage on the surrounding citizens. Even in Film Red, it was Fujitora that had to remind Kizaru. Despite the fact that Kizaru's been an admiral for longer than Fujitora, Fujitora reminded him that, hey, we shouldn't fight with the red hair pirates because there are a lot of civilians around. If we go to war, we're putting a lot of lives at risk. And I know that Film Red obviously isn't 100% percent canon or the general events of Film Red weren't canon and only select characters, only select aspects are. But I think when the writers wrote this scene, I think they were mindful of the characters' personalities and I think the scene that they wrote was actually very much in keeping with what we know of these characters. Even if Kizaru was an admiral like Sakazuki or Ryokugu, even then I would say that 
it would be much easier to understand his actions of killing his friend because of their blind sense of justice, that aggressive sense of absolute justice. Because of their values, they just wholeheartedly believe in the Marines as an institution and believe in the authority of the world government and the Marines. But Kizaru is that one admiral that doesn't have any strong conviction. When Sengoku stepped down at the end of the Marineford arc and the fleet admiral position became available, as far as we know, Kizaru didn't put his hand up for the position. He didn't want that position. He didn't care enough about the future of the institution of the Marines to take on that responsibility. Kuzan and Sakazuki cared. Kuzan, despite being the lazy justice, he cared. Both Kuzan and Sakazuki, they deeply cared about that position because they knew that whoever took on that role would play an instrumental part in shaping the future of the marines, in shaping the culture and the ethos of the marines. When Sakazuki won, Kuzan cared so much that he decided he couldn't be in an institution when Sakazuki, a man with those morals, he didn't want to serve in an institution where Sakazuki would be the leader. Did Borsalino step down? No, because he didn't care all that much. His justice is ambiguous, it's unclear, he's much more flexible. Even if we consider Kuma's flashback, Borsalino isn't so high and mighty that he thinks it's unacceptable or inappropriate for him to become friends with Kuma and Bonnie. Even when they're doing the goddamn Nika dance, the Nika dance, Kizaru doesn't stop and think to himself, hang on, this is top class secret. You guys shouldn't know about Nika. You guys shouldn't be celebrating Nika. You shouldn't be dancing like this. It's my job as a Marine, as the Marine Admiral, to put an end to this sort of activity. Kizaru just joins in on the fun. He's smack bang in the center of this dance circle. And that's what makes this loyalty to the Marines even more baffling. Why does a man without any great sense of conviction, any overwhelming belief when it comes to the Marines, why does he care so much about carrying out his duty when it's even to the extent of killing his own best friend. And I think the fact we are now forced to ask this question, this makes Kizaru's story, his character, even more intriguing. It really opens up so many questions about Kizaru's past and his reasons and his motivations for joining the Marines and becoming an admiral. And I think to that end, I think Oda is saving Kizaru's backstory because there has to be a reason to explain Kizaru's enduring loyalty, his enduring sense of duty to the Marines, a loyalty that exists even though conviction doesn't. There has to be something else that was motivating his actions here. And if I was to add my two cents and speculate on what I think those reasons, on what I think those motivations were, I'm gonna say that I think Kizaru has no sense of justice. I don't think he's with the Marines for any ideological, any value-driven reason. I think Kizaru might be loyal to the Marines because of a much more personal reason. In chapter 1091, we see Sentomaru say that he will betray the Marines and he will side with the pirates if that means he is helping his savior. And I think that's exactly the type of relationship that Kizaru has with the Marines. Perhaps as a child, Kizaru was an orphan or maybe a child who was simply in danger's way, maybe because of the pirates. Either way, the person who took him in, the person who saved him was a marine officer. Who knows, maybe it was Sengoku himself or maybe even Suru. In any case, I think Kizaru from that point forth he decided that he was going to dedicate his life to the Marines. Not for any ideological reasons, but simply because of his gratitude, simply because he felt indebted to the Marines. And that's just my theory for now. But speculations aside, I think this character arc, this development of Kizaru, I think this actually makes all the Marines and all the Marine Admirals so much more interesting. I really love that panel of Kizaru crying in chapter 1124 and that whole segment and exchange with Sakazuki. Because this was not only the most emotional and emotive we've seen of Kizaru, which in itself is a pretty big deal because we do know him to be a much more apathetic, detached, cool, generally unemotional character. And so this did a great deal to humanize his character. But I would actually say that this is probably the most 
any of the admirals has been humanized in the series, because I would actually say that this humanizes Kizaru even more than what we've seen of Kuzan in the past. But not only does it just humanize Kizaru as a character, I think it humanizes all of the marines. And here in particular, it really humanizes Sakazuki. Sakazuki is usually portrayed as a brutal, unfeeling man. But here, even when a subordinate rebukes him, insults him. Sakazuki empathizes with Kizaru. He calls him brother. And so I'm really intrigued as to what this means for Sakazuki's character. I think that piece of dialogue when Kizaru asks Sakazuki, have you ever had to kill one of your best friends? Do you know what that feels like? I think that's a significant piece of dialogue, not just because of what it means between Vegapunk and Kizaru, but because of what it suggests for Sakazuki and his other relationships. After reading this, I had to go back and remember what happened between Sakazuki and Kuzan at Punk Hazard. Because Jinbei did say that at the sight of his longtime comrade at his mercy, even Akainu couldn't find himself to kill Aokiji. But I don't think even after reading that, back in chapter 650, I don't think I thought very hard as to what this really meant for Sakazuki. I don't think I really dwelled that much on how Sakazuki must have felt in this moment. How hard that battle must have been for him, not just physically but emotionally. Was Sakazuki in pain about having to fight, having to battle to the deaths a fellow brother? By virtue of this series having a friendly pirate crew as its protagonist, I think it's pretty easy to start generalizing the marines and the world government as the antagonists. I think it's easy to just paint them as the bad guys. And so I think it's easy to forget that the marines and especially antagonists like Sakazuki, that they are still humans at the end of the day. But One Piece is, and it has always been, so much more than just a simply black and white story about good versus bad. This story has always been so much more nuanced than that. I think another really good, clear example of this complex human relationship and emotions, something that was also present to us in Egghead was the relationship between the CP0 members, the friendship and the bond between Luchi, Kaku, and Stussy. And now with what we're seeing between Sakazuki and Kizaru, we're really seeing the nitty gritty of the full range of human emotions. The motivations, the inconsistent and at times paradoxical motivations that drive human behavior the way that they do. And so this naturally also made me start thinking about another potential important relationship involving Sakazuki, albeit it is a heavily speculative relationship, but this is the relationship between Dragon and Sakazuki. So like I said, this is a relationship that is heavily based on theory, but albeit a pretty commonly known and a you know, widely popular theory. So now it's been confirmed that Dragon was once part of the Marines, but he left to form the Revolutionaries. But even before this was revealed, a lot of fans speculated that Dragon and Sakazuki once did have some sort of relationship. Even though this hasn't really been touched on in this series so far, the fact that they're the same age, the fact that Sakazuki seems so hell-bent on targeting Luffy during Marineford. A lot of us speculated that there must be more between Sakazuki and Dragon. Well, now I'm going to speculate that Dragon and Sakazuki were best friends. Best friends who went up the rank of the Marines together. These two were inseparable Marine officers until one day something happened that made Dragon question his role in the Marines, where he was forced to reflect in his role and he decided to follow his values and ideologies and decided to leave the Marines. Now let's say that there was a moment where Sakazuki had to try and stop him. Maybe the only way to stop him was to have killed him. Was Sakazuki able to do it? Could he have killed his own best friend? Well obviously Dragon is alive, whether that has anything to do with Sakazuki or not. But maybe Sakazuki has, ever since that moment, lived in regret for not being able to stop Dragon. For allowing his best friend, his former comrade in arms, his brother, allowing his brother to turn on the institution that he has dedicated his life to and start a whole new organization that 
actively opposes the world government. Maybe that's why he was so fixated on Luffy. I mean, can you imagine if this is the reason why Sakazuki is the brutal man that he is today? Even when he killed that Marine for deserting the Marines at Marineford. Maybe he did so because he was reminded about his own experience at letting Dragon go. Anyways, I think I've let my brain do too much head cannoning. But I think you know what I mean. This interaction, this exchange between Kizaru and Sakazuki, this really helps us recontextualize the Marines much more broadly. In fact, that's actually why Film Z is my all-time favorite One Piece film. It demonstrates the real camaraderie that exists between the Brotherhood of Marines. And I can't wait for Oda to explore these deeper, complex themes in greater depth. In fact, I think that's what we're actually building up towards with Kobe. Kobe's dialogue in chapter 1122 that was another confusing, perhaps polarizing moment. But I think this goes back to the very conflicting, the counterposed difficult lives that everyone lives in this world. Whether you're a pirate, whether you're a marine, whether you're a revolutionary. As humans, we all have these inconsistent, polarized, nonsensical motivations and emotions that drive us in the ways that they do. And as for Kizaru losing his best friend, as for Kizaru killing his best friend, well, I guess the one silver lining, the one thought that he might be able to console himself with, I think the one thing he could say to himself and that we could say to him is that at least it was him. At least it was Kizaru. And ironically, beautifully, tragically, Kizaru played the biggest role in allowing Vegapunk to fulfill his dying wish. In the same way that Vegapunk pulled the plug on Kuma, it was Kizaru that pushed the kill switch on Vegapunk. And this then led to the broadcast of Vegapunk's message to the rest of the world. Which just happens to be what Vegapunk wanted all along. Vegapunk knew his life was over. He accepted that the moment he found out the world government knew of his research about the world's history. He accepted his death bravely and resolutely and he went out with a bang. And in that classic twist of fate, in that classic twist of irony that Oda loves so much, Kizaru Kizaru helped Vegapunk to do this. By killing his best friend, Kizaru helped Vegapunk inspire people all around the world to have and develop a sense and this thirst for truth a thirst for knowledge, which just happens to be what bound Vegapunk and Kizaru in the first place. Their mutual shared love and respect for each other was built on their love for knowledge, on scientific progress, their commitment to human advancement through technology. And if that's not bittersweet, then I don't know what is. And now that the Egghead Island arc does seem to be over, these are now my thoughts on Kizaru. But obviously, I'd love to know what you guys think, so make sure to leave a comment below. If you've liked the video, please do like and please do subscribe. I'd really love your help in getting to 100k subscribers. Thank you as always to our Patreon and channel members for supporting this channel and you too can join these lovely people on screen by becoming a Patreon channel member. But of course, as always, I just appreciate your being here. So on that note, thank you for tuning in to another one of my videos. I shall see you very shortly. This is Joy Girl and I'll see you again soon.